Hello, welcome to the Toronto Geometry Colloquium. This is a weekly web series that's all about geometry processing. <clears throat> this colloquium aims at promoting young researchers and the re um, researchers from traditionally underrepresented communities. Every week, we will have an opener talking about their cutting edge research for 10 minutes, followed by a headliner giving us a keynote presentation. And this week, we have two fantastic speakers that I can't wait to introduce. Like our opener, Mark Galepsby is going to talk about discrete conformal equivalence of polyhedral surfaces. And our headliner, Dr. Deepa Lee Amnesia, is going to talk about performance-based facial animation. And if you have any questions, please leave comments in the YouTube chat or our Discord channel. So first, it's my great, great pleasure to introduce our opener, Mark. And he's a very talented PhD student at the Carnegie Mellon University, advised by Keenan Crane. So personally, I'm really a big fan of Mark's research and his research is not just a, like a paper to me, they are like a really a piece of art. So his paper shows some, how some deep mathematical concepts such as ideas from hyperbolic geometry or geometric topology can be used to create elegant solutions to very challenging problems in our field. And this work not only solves the problem, but it also inspires us to see the problem from a completely different perspective, such as how can we flip the edge of a triangle mesh without caring about triangle equality. So today we are so lucky to, that we can have Mark to talk about his groundbreaking work on conformal equivalence. So please join me to welcome Mark. All right, thank you very much for that kind introduction, Derek. Uh, is my screen all right? I guess it is. So, yes. Hi everyone. Today, I'd like to tell you about how a classic theorem from differential geometry can help us robustly parameterize meshes. Our goal is to compute some high quality surface parameterizations. That is mappings from a mesh to the plane that don't distort the mesh too much. And to do this, we use this approach called cone flattening, where the basic idea is that rather than directly optimizing a map from our mesh to the plane, we instead pick out this sparse set of cone vertices and find edge lengths which make the mesh intrinsically flat away from these cones. This intermediate surface can then be easily cut open and laid out in the plane, yielding the final parameterization. Now, a careful cone placement keeps the parameterization's area distortion low, and ensuring that our flattening is conformal keeps the angle distortion low. And then, as usual, once we have this parameterization, we can visualize it by interpolating a texture across the original mesh. Now, why are we still talking about parameterization after all these years? Well, for one thing, people want to parameterize some ridiculously challenging meshes these days. And for another, while cones are essential for reducing area distortion and for generating some high quality quad meshes, they aren't handled by many classic algorithms. So in this work, we introduced a new algorithm for surface parameterization that works well even on low quality input geometry and complex cone configurations and can also compute conformal maps to the sphere. Our work builds on the recent discrete uniformization theorem, which essentially states that any triangle mesh with any choice of cones can be parameterized by a discrete conformal map. But even once you know this theorem, there's still quite a lot of work required to apply it to meshes in practice. Getting into some specifics, our algorithm is a generalization of the classic CETM algorithm for parameterization. If you've never heard of CETM, don't worry, I'll review all of the relevant background in a moment. But for those of you who are familiar with that paper, here's a quick rundown of the differences. First, unlike the fixed triangulation CETM, we allow mesh connectivity to change during optimization. In particular, we modify the mesh using simple operations that we call Ptolemy flips, which allow us to sidestep the problem of invalid geometry that can arise when using CETM. These changes to the mesh allow us to guarantee that our algorithm will return a valid parameterization. But now we have to do a little bit more work to run our algorithm on top of this changing mesh. For one thing, we have to keep track of the correspondence between the original mesh and this mesh with flipped edges. To do so, we introduced a robust new data structure composed of normal coordinates and a new piece of data called roundabouts. Furthermore, we proposed a new interpolation scheme based on the hyperboloid model of hyperbolic space, which produces much better results than ordinary linear interpolation in this setting. And then finally, as I mentioned before, we can also compute discrete conformal maps to the sphere as well as parameterizations to the plane. Now in today's talk, I'll mostly focus on these connectivity changes, but I'll also briefly touch on spherical uniformization as well. Okay, so now let's talk about how you actually compute discrete conformal parameterizations. Along the way, we'll see what Ptolemy flips are and why they're so helpful. But before diving into the details, I first really need to say what exactly I mean by discrete conformal map. 
If you ask a mathematician what conformal means, they'll probably tell you that conformal maps are maps that preserve angles. And that sounds great since you can easily check if a map between triangle meshes preserves angles. However, it turns out that this criterion is way too strict. The only way of deforming a triangle mesh without changing any corner angles is just a global scaling or rigid motion. And that's not gonna help us parameterize meshes. Luckily, there are a bunch of other characterizations of conformal map maps, which lead naturally to a variety of interesting algorithms. In this work, we take the metric scaling perspective, which just says that if you zoom in really close to some point in your domain, then a conformal map just scales this region up or down. The analogous discrete notion is called vertex scaling. Given some log scale factor u at each vertex, we scale each edge length by the average of the u values at its endpoints. So for example, here, if we set u to one at vertex i and set u to zero at all other vertices, then all of the edges incident on vertex i get longer while all other edges remain the same length. And now while this definition appears very simple, it's actually just flexible enough to lead to a rich mathematical theory capturing many of the nice properties that smooth conformal maps have. And one of the most important properties captured by vertex scaling is the uniformization theorem. In the smooth setting, the uniformization theorem guarantees that any surface can be conformally mapped to one of constant curvature. But amazingly, there's an analogous discrete uniformization theorem for triangle meshes, which guarantees that given any triangle mesh and any valid curvature, there's some vertex scaling which induces that curvature, no matter how wild your mesh is. The discrete uniformization theorem was actually only proved in the last few years, but people have been working on it for quite some time. It all started in 2004 when Luo gave a flow which evolves a set of scale factors until they achieve the desired curvatures. Luo observed that this flow was the gradient flow of a locally convex energy, which was then given in explicit form by Springborn and colleagues in 2008. So essentially, you can find discrete conformal maps to the plane by simply minimizing some convex energy. However, there's a big problem with this approach. This simple procedure doesn't always work on a fixed mesh. And the reason is that triangles can degenerate. If you make one edge of a triangle too long, then the other edges can't reach each other anymore, and these edge lengths don't define a valid triangle at all. In his original paper, Luo suggested handling this issue by flipping an edge at the moment when a triangle degenerates. However, these edge flips, shown as vertical lines in the plot, cause discontinuous jumps in the energy, voiding any guarantee that the flow will converge to a minimizer. Later in 2018, Gu and colleagues proposed performing edge flips during the flow to maintain a Delaunay triangulation instead. These Delaunay flips keep the energy nice and continuous, and C2 even, meaning that the flow will provably converge. However, this requires computing the exact time when the Delaunay condition is violated and pausing there to perform the necessary edge flips. We instead pursue an alternative strategy enabled by hyperbolic geometry. The main idea proposed by Bobenko and colleagues in 2010 is to take our input mesh and reinterpret it as an ideal hyperbolic polyhedron. Algorithmically, this just means that whenever we want to perform an edge flip, we compute the length of the new edge using this Ptolemy formula rather than the standard Euclidean formula. Hence, we refer to this operation as a Ptolemy flip. Crucially, we can even apply the Ptolemy formula in cases where the Euclidean edge flip is undefined. As long as you have some edge lengths, you can plug them into this equation and find the new length. The other key fact about Ptolemy flips is that they're decoupled from vertex scaling. You can scale and then flip, or flip and then scale, or even scale partway and then flip and scale the rest of the way, and you always get the same answer. So in particular, there's no reason to stop your flow at certain times to flip. You can just defer the flips until later when they're more convenient without changing the result at all. With Ptolemy flips, it's now easy to scale by any scale factors you want, and there's no need to worry about degeneracy anymore. Given any mesh with any set of scale factors, you can simply scale up your mesh's edges. Of course, this may break some of your triangles, but we can now use Ptolemy flips to obtain a valid Euclidean Delaunay triangulation, even starting out from these broken triangles. And amazingly, even once we start flipping edges, the energy, the energy that we're trying to minimize remains convex and twice continuously differentiable. So the task of discrete conformal parameterization really does now boil down to a simple, unconstrained convex optimization problem that we can solve with any off-the-shelf optimizer. All right, so that's the story of discrete conformal parameterization with Ptolemy flips. Now let's take a quick look at spherical uniformization before moving on to some results. So far, I've been talking all about mapping meshes to the plane. However, we can also apply all of this machinery to map surfaces to the sphere instead. More explicitly, given any genus zero triangle mesh, 
we can compute a discretely conformally equivalent polyhedron, which is convex and inscribed in the unit sphere. The general approach is quite similar to flattening. Indeed, we begin by computing a discrete conformal map from our mesh to the plane, but then we can project the plane up onto the sphere to obtain the desired map to the sphere. As ever, the story is complicated by the fact that the mesh connectivity may change during optimization. However, the hyperbolic picture saves us yet again, and by appealing to some even more mysterious hyperbolic geometry, you can get this whole procedure working. Okay, so that's the algorithm. Now let's take a look at some results. We evaluated our algorithm on several challenging datasets. We tested cone flattening on the MPZ and Thingy10K datasets and spherical uniformization on, mesh, on brain scans and other anatomical surfaces. We successfully produced locally injective discrete conformal maps on all of the models, with the exception of Thingy10K, where we achieved a 97.7% success rate due to some floating point issues on some of the most degenerate models. The code was generally fast, often finishing in a matter of seconds, although it took up to half an hour on a few of the most challenging Thingy10K inputs. In practice, we found that Ptolemy flips provide a definite performance benefit, often providing a 2x speedup in our experiments. And on models with badly shaped triangles, we find that our novel interpolation scheme provides a huge improvement over ordinary linear interpolation. And even when the fixed triangulation CETM succeeds, our variable triangulation method and novel interpolation can produce much smoother results. Finally, let's take a look at some limitations in future work. First of all, while variable triangulations are the key to our robustness, it's sometimes annoying that we output texture coordinates on a refined mesh rather than on the input mesh itself. It would be interesting to investigate schemes to simplify this output, perhaps by trying to unflip edges. Next, if all you care about is local injectivity rather than full conformal maps, then you can track correspondence in a simpler way. There may be room for other optimizations in this setting too. And lastly, and much more speculatively, it would be interesting to work on expanding the story into higher dimensions. The smooth 2D uniformization theorem has a 3D cousin called the geometrization theorem. However, the geometrization theorem is far more complicated and mathematical work on a discrete version is only just beginning. Among the many difficulties involved in moving from 2D to 3D is the fact that intrinsic Delaunay triangulations, an essential tool in both the theory of discrete uniformization and our algorithm become much more complicated in three dimensions. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Mark, for this fantastic talk as always. And we will proceed to the talk of our headliner and have a joint Q&A near the end. So now it is my great pleasure to introduce our headliner, Dr. Deepali Anesha. She's a researcher at Adobe. And before that, she obtained a PhD at the University of Washington. And her research is really forward looking. <clears throat> so these days, we're all talking about the metaverse and how can we control our avatars to have meetings in the virtual reality. But even before we know this term metaverse, Dipali already started to research on related topics during her PhD. Specifically, her research focused on how to control the facial animation of these digital characters, including how we can translate the audio to a lips animation, or how can we uh, translate the human facial expression to those stylized characters. And her research also made an amazing impact in this field and made her the recipient of Adobe Research Fellowship in 2018. So without further delay, please join me to welcome Dee Lee to talk about a performance-based facial animation. Thanks, Derek, for a great introduction. Let me share my screen. Hi, can you all share, see my screen? Yes. Oh, yeah, so first of all, I would like to thank all the um, organizers for this, uh, for putting these series together, um, and thanks for inviting me here. I would uh, just add more to my introduction and give some background. As I Derek mentioned, I did my PhD from UW in 2019, and then I joined Adobe Research as a research engineer. I work at the intersection of computer graphics, vision, and machine learning. And in the past few years, I have shipped a lip sync feature for character animator and animate in Adobe products. I also work in vector graphics research and I was involved in vectorized feature uh, for Illustrator for iPad. So this technology takes your sketches, photographs and other artwork and uh, converts them into vector graphics. Today, I will focus on performance-based animation, some of, work, some of the work I did during my PhD and some of it that I'm continuing to do at Adobe. So let's start with expressive characters. So animation has been a popular storytelling technique. The power of the story is lies when the people can actually 
understand what the expressiveness of the character is being is being shown on the screen. So viewers' emotional investment in a character depends on the clear recognition of character's emotional state. So in order to generate expressive characters, we need to understand and model how these expressions are created and how we perceive them. We can create these expressions by drawing or just by transferring these expressions through automated methods. So how about these automated systems? We are good at making expressions with our face. So here are some of the examples of industry standard tools and techniques that are used for expression transfer in 2D and 3D. And once we create these expressive characters, how can we have engaging and convincing conversations with these agents? So the outline for my talk is um, as follows. I will talk about three things, expressions, lip sync, and virtual agents. Much of my work uses uh, face, uh, just face cameras and webcams to capture the emotional state of the face and the algorithms to uh, capture and analyze those emotions. So let's start with the richest source of human emotion, facial, the human face. Traditional tools for creating animations are labor intensive, requiring animators to spend a lot of time, a lot of hours to create these motion curves by hand. So here's an example in Maya of an animator just spending a lot of time creating these expressions and getting all the little details right. An alternate workflow is to equip animators with direct real-time control over, oh yeah, over digital characters via performance, which offers a more immediate and effective way to create animation. Here's such an example where an expression transfer uh, is taking place. The animator is spending a lot of time fixing and annotating the curves. What you would see as the expression target happens, the, the human on the right side is smiling, but the character can also give a mixed expression, which might not always match with the uh, intended human expression. So the current expression transfer systems are based on translating geometric features from humans to characters. The problem with the system is while the feature points transfer to the character, the expressions do not. Here's another example where human looks sad and the character looks a little bit more confused. So despite recent advances in modern and modeling capabilities, motion capture and control parameterization, current methods do not address the fundamental problem of creating clear expressions that humans recognize as the intended expression. And Moving forward, there's another open research question. What happens when we go beyond human geometry and we do not have one-to-one facial, one -one facial mapping going from human faces to you know, amazing cartoon characters like these where uh, they, are, they just have different geometric features? So I would just give an overview of uh, the first work that I did during my PhD uh, that was retargeting convincing 3D character expressions. So this was done a while ago, so there are uh, better and you know just other advanced deep learning networks also handling this problem. So I would just define this problem as geometry or facts-based expression retargeting is not always perceptually accurate and often often lacks expressiveness. And how we handled it at that time uh, to create perceptually valid expression targeting model. Here are some of the related works in that in the field of expression target targeting in two D and three D. So we solved this problem first by doing it in 2D by retrieving the exact perceived expression in, um, from a database. And our goal was to retrieve the closest expression character match using a perceptual model augmenting with geometry. The first thing uh, that we noticed when we were doing this project was not a lot of uh, well annotated training data sets are available for stylized cartoon characters. So we created a training data set by working with an animator and spending a lot of time, many hours, to create this validated label data set. And we aggregated publicly available data sets for a human data set uh, to compare it with our uh, performance and do the analysis. And here is the overview of the expression retrieval model that we built. So in details at this point, um, we first have a step to learn the human feature space, then we have another step to do the character feature space, and then we learn the mapping between going from human feature space to character feature space. And once we learn that mapping, we apply that mapping to retrieve characters using the perceptual model mapping and human geometry. So without going into the details of the network, uh, I will just show some results. Uh, so the first one is given a query image. Uh, we used gen and channel divergence distance to get the results in the correct expression match, but also, but the 
But you would notice not always the closest geometric match in this case. So the query example is a joyous human face, and you're getting all the joyous retrieval images if you use Jen and Shannon distance to the feature mappings between human and characters, but they're not sorted by geometry. So we did another parameter and added geometric distance to get the expression match and also get the closest match in, match in geometry. So as you can see, these are sorted from the closest match to the uh, as the smile gets wider um, in the happiness uh, expression retrieval. Here are some more other examples in expression categories for disgust, fear, and um, anger, showing multiple retrieval results on different characters. For evaluation, we did um, an average retrieval score, and I would like to highlight uh, the result here. As you can see, uh, qualitatively, the query image here is, if on the top row, it's the discussed expression. And if you just do a quick geometry search, you would get something which is more like anger, because anger and disgust get very easily confused with closed mouth and uh, eyebrow expressions. But if you do the deep expression and adding the perceptual metrics, you would get uh, the disgust expression. Similarly, expression fear and surprise gets very easily confused with open mouth and wide eyes. And you would see uh, the query expression here is fear, but the Retrieve geometry expression looks more like surprised, but when you do a perceptual match, uh, you, you see the match is more close to the query image, that is fear. And we still had some of the failure cases when we tried it out on newer characters. So as you can see, joy get, also gets easily confused with surprise and neutral gets easily confused with very subtle sad faces, like in this case. We continued working in this direction and then um, made progress in expression retargeting in 3D. Here I'll play a quick result video where the human video is shown on the top and then you can see different characters showing an expression retargeting results um, of different expression categories. All right, so the approach here was we processed the data uh, uh, for human images, and then we built a model, 3 CNN, to go from human data to the primary character. So we did it for one character, and then we had a simple lightweight multi-layer perceptron to do from one character to multiple character transfer expressions. So our goal was to automatically generate 3D stylized character expressions from human in a perceptually valid way and a geometrically consistent manner as we did in 2D. Here is a quick overview of data and pre-processing. So we had expression classes, anger, disgust, fear, neutral, joy, sadness, and surprise. And uh, we added more characters to our Ford uh, database uh, with almost 55,000 images. And we also added the annotation to 3D rig parameters and geometry extraction for these characters as shown in the bottom row. Here is an overview of the network architecture. So the key of, to our system is that we create a similarity between human images and character images. And then we use this similarity to drive the 3D parameters of characters model directly from human images. As you can see on the top right, we use a triplet for generation based on both EG is the geometry match and EP is the perceptual match. And we use the similarity to drive our um, details of the network that are given the paper. And then we transfer the expression to the primary character. And then we have a lightweight method to transfer it to multiple characters as shown in, as secondary characters. Here are some of the results uh, with primary characters showing in different categories. And here are some of the results showing it in on multiple categories. And as you can see, it generalizes well when you add new category, new characters, like the ones on the right shown. Um, and we also tried a non-humanoid character, a dog, which still has a similar geometry. Um, and the expression was well transferred in 3D from given a human um, 2D image input. For a quick evaluation, we compared it with the state-of-the-art face wear technology. And you can see uh, on the top, we show the input expression result as discussed and, um, and the expression generation result uh, shows a more perceptual match in both the categories as discussed and fear as I've shown in some of the examples. And we also did quantitative comparison where we asked people uh, on Mechanical Turk to choose uh, which ones 
are more closely related to the input query and our method was statistically significant in terms of the um, the chosen result for a closer uh, closer evaluation so a quick summary uh, so we we solved this problem by creating a data driven perceptual model of facial expressions and we also evaluated our results against perceptions of the real people by doing mechanical direct testing and um, the future work is to go beyond human geometry. And this is something that uh, we are working on. I would like to show some of the examples of these cool characters like uh, uh, non-humanoid animal characters that do not always have you know, two eyes and a mouth that you can map to. Um, so this is an open research and we're continuing to work on that. So this is for the facial expression work. Uh, next, I would like to move on to lip sync. So while facial retargeting gives performance expressive control, over the animation, another essential component of almost every live animation performance is speech. So as a result, another critical component of performance to animation mapping for live animation is lip sync. So that's, that means transforming actors' speech into corresponding mouth movements in the animator, uh, movements in the animated character. So this work was primarily done as an intern uh, when I was at Adobe Research during my PhD, and I'm continuing to work on it uh, as I've joined Adobe. So here's the problem statement. So can we automatically generate lip sync that is still usable in real time? And also can we improve the offline case where uh, we use the transcript to generate the lip sync results? And we decided to come up with mapping function that maps from vocal performance to regimes or mouth shapes in real time. In particular, we wanted to not only be accurate, but also as low latency as possible. So you can actually use them in live settings. Uh, there is a large body of previous research that utilizes model-driven methods to learn generative models for producing lip sync from speech. Uh, the critical part here is that lip sync for 2D animation is typically done by first creating a discrete set of mouth shapes, which are called regimes, that map to individual units of speech for each character. And it takes hours and hours of data creation and, uh, and then putting it together. So these are the 2D lip sync challenges that are different from 3D lip sync, that collecting data is hard and it's labor intensive. And the animators also work with a constraint palette uh, that they draw the, uh, the annotation of these lips or lip shapes or regimes in advance. And then there's the um, challenge of getting the transition timing right whenever we show the result. So um, some of the details are, technical details are confidential. So I would just give uh, the overview of the pipeline of how we solve this problem. Um, so our system, while, we, like, you know, while it relies on the existing architecture, so we take the odd, so this is the live lip sync case. So we rely on the existing architecture, but one of the contribution is in identifying the appropriate feature representation and network configuration to achieve state of the art results for live lip sync. And another key contribution is our that method for collecting the training data for our model. So the input is the audio input. We train an end-to-end -end network, and we get the regime output. Uh, and as you can see, I've shown Homer Simpson here uh, in 2D, just showing different mouth shapes as an output. And the full frame accuracy uh, we achieved was around 66% in training this end-to-end -end model. The data we collected was almost 20 minutes of hand annotated data. And we used uh, some of the Timid data set uh, to generate a data augment. Um, and then we uh, augmented this data uh, around four to five times. Here are the details of augmenting data. So we used um, uh, uh, dynamic time warping to align other, re other recordings of the same sentence spoken um, in the reference sentence as the Timid data. And then we just mapped the labels to other sentences. Here's a quick summary of the lip sync model that is um, single layer LSTM with a temporal shift of uh, six feature vectors and the audio feature that consists of MFCC, log mean energy, and the first temporal derivative that we used. Here we are showing the impact of data augmentation. Uh, as you can see, we divided um, at, we, the unaugment data is shown in the purple bar and the accuracy as we kept adding more and more training batches was uh, capped at 55%. And when we augmented the data around four times, the accuracy went up to 67%. So without uh, further going to more details, I would like to show some results and how it compares with uh, competing methods that are industry standard. 
So it's hard to evaluate the lip sync results just by looking at them. So I would uh, play each result on its own. Ben spent ten dollars getting his neck checked. Ben spent ten dollars getting his neck checked. Ben spent ten dollars getting his neck checked. My mother was beside herself with curiosity. 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 Just apologize to the gentle giant giraffe. 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 Yeah, so moving on uh, to some of the comparisons. So we generated a, lo a lot of pairwise comparisons to compare our method with, uh, as we showed, online methods that are done in real time and also the offline methods compared to Tone Boom. Uh, that's another uh, industry standard tool that's used for 2D lip sync. And we could, um, here we show some of the results from Mechanical Turk. We asked people to choose which one looked um, right and more accurate. And as you can see, our model was preferred over the version strained with <clears throat> no augmented data and also with uh, two thirds of the augmented data. So CH on is the online version of the character animator. CH off is the character animator offline version and TV off uh, is the Toon Boom offline version. Here, uh, we want to show how it runs live. This is the first take and not spending days on getting the best shot. Um, and uh, it was just turned on and uh, let's record the situation. This last section of the video shows our lip sync model running in real time in a modified version of Adobe Character Animator. The footage was captured live and the audio was delayed slightly to account for the small latency in the Vizim predictions. Hello, hello, check one, two. You can see that this is a, a live capture, so I'm kind of waving my arms right now. Um, the mic's picking up my voice and animating this Chloe character as I talk. So normally we would also enable face tracking to give the performance more life, but here we want you to focus on the lip sync, so uh, we've turned that off. So since, since this is captured live, the lip sync engine has no knowledge of the script ahead of time. I can literally say whatever I want. Boom shakalaka. Also, I'll point out that my voice was not used in any of the uh, training data for the model. And I also wanted to quickly mention that um, we've also been working on transcript-based lip sync. Uh, that takes, uh, so moving for ahead from just using the audio as the input, uh, when we use the transcript as the input, and this is the overview, and we use the time-aligned phonemes, and then we do a mapping from phonemes to regimes. Uh, and then we just generate a sequence of a Zeme sequence um, that's uh, also a uh, work in progress. And then we've shipped initial version in character animator in December of 2021. So quick overview of uh, the different methods and results I showed. We developed an accurate speech, uh, generalizable and low latency lip sync model for live 2D animation. We performed extensive human judgment experiments to demonstrate the technique improves over existing state-of-the-art results. And we developed transcript-based lip sync for better accuracy. And some of the video results are also uploaded on GitHub to uh, view, watch for later. And some of the future work directions that we're looking into is improving metrics for lip sync, because it's really hard to evaluate uh, these kind of results. And then also, if you can fine tune for a particular style of the user of, you know, in based on the accent or uh, just transition timings. All right, this brings us to the last uh, uh, research area that I want to quickly touch upon uh, and some of the work I've done on virtual agents. So we've created perceptually valid expressions and perceptually valid lip sync. And to validate the importance of these expression retargeting and lip sync, we explored adding expressiveness to a virtual agent by enhancing its facial expression and lip sync capabilities. And we tested human agent interaction with an extensive user study. 
So the problem statement is that um, for existence, the existing um, virtual virtual agents are monotonic in behavior and do not adapt to their partner. So how can we make this human behavior and this interaction more engaging and responsive to the user's speech? Uh, embodied conversation agents to give an overview are interactive virtual characters, like some of them shown, shown here, that combine facial expressions, speech, and gestures to enable face-to-face -face communication with the users. Most of these agents rely upon scripted dialogue or prescribed intents that had to be pre-trained, limiting the opportunities for less constrained interaction. So here we uh, want to highlight uh, related work on the style matching. So what do you mean by style? So for understanding human conversation style, we follow Deborah Tannen's theory that's mostly widely used. The so Tannen character categorizes kind of conversational style into highly considerate and highly involvement. So the highly considerate style emphasizes consideration, independence, and characterized by slower and hesitant speech and longer pauses, whereas highly involved style emphasizes interpersonal involvement, interest and understanding, and characterized by faster and louder speech with shorter pauses between conversational turns. We use these two speech, uh, we use these two conversational style parameters to um, base our user studies, as I will talk about next. Uh, we present Siva, socially intelligent virtual agent, an expressive embodied conversational agent that can recognize human behavior during open-ended conversations and automatically align its response to the visual and the conversational style of the other party. This is an open-ended avatar that built in uh, Unreal Engine that can be controlled by a simple Python programming interface. This avatar has lip syncing, phoneme control, head gesture, and facial expression using the facial action units or cardinal emotion categories capabilities. The design of Siva is truly multimodal, allowing for capture of audiovisual features and synthesis of engaging face-to-face -face conversations with a human. We build components to sense and analyze the audio signal from the user for conversational style matching and generating lip sync and perform text sentiment analysis for extracting the contextual information and sense and analyze the user's video feed using for visual style matching. We finally synthesize aligned parameters for the perceptually valid audio and visual behavior of the agent. Here we show an overview of the architecture. We built components to sense and analyze the audio signal from the user for conversational style matching and generating the lip sync, performing text sentiment analysis for extracting the, sorry, extracting the contextual information and sensing the, and analyzing the audio or the user's video feed for expressive style matching. The different style parameters that we use um, in our project are given here. Uh, so Siva performs both conversational and expressive style matching based on user's interaction style during the conversation and uh, using the listed style variables. We did an extensive user study to investigate the effect of this matching and on users' perception of the system. And we conducted uh, with 30 users with two interaction conditions one web participants interacting with Siva using conversational and expressive style matching, that is experimental condition. The other interacting with Siva with no style matching, that's control condition. Here's the first result where the participants rated the style matching condition to be more statistically significant reflective of their emotions compared to the control condition. So when they were interacting with the agent that was expressive and was adapting to their style, uh, the users connected to that agent more than the control condition where the user was just, uh, the agent was just mono monotonous in the response. The results also showed that participants perceived SIVA to exhibit more convincing non-verbal behavior uh, for the style matching condition compared to the control. Here, uh, another result for evaluating agents' impressions, we found a significant interaction for perception of animacy. So the highly involved conversational style group found the expressive style matching agent to be more lively and natural, whereas the highly uh, uh, conversational style participants paid more attention to the verbal communication and perceived the control condition to be more natural. Here are given um, results for both animacy and anthropomorphism. The results for animacy were uh, statistically significant, as you can see on the top graph, left side, highly involvement versus highly considerate style. And the top, the bottom graph is showing uh, 
showing the result for the anthropomorphism uh, perceived by the users. Now I will show a quick demo. Uh, here, here's an interaction demo from a user study uh, where the participant was performing one of the tasks. What do you do for fun? I love to just hang out and talk to people. What do you like to do? I like to play some video games. Since I have no hands, all I can play is mind games. Are there any games you like to play? Ever, have you ever played board games? Yes, I have played a few games of war games. So to conclude, our work addresses the key challenge in the emerging domain of um, interaction with embodied conversational agents. We presented uh, Seva, the embodied conversational agent that's capable of longer conversations with the user, examined how multimodal conversational and expressive style matching influences a user's perception of the emotional behavior and connection with the agent, and demonstrated how style matching influences the perception of the agent. We found that the agent was considered more animate by people who preferred interpersonal involvement and less animate by people who preferred independence. Um, just uh, the final discussion slide where uh, we built the expressive conversational agent, studied the style matching and the avatar rigs and videos are available on GitHub as well. And we uh, there's um, future work that uh, we are excited about improving conversational training, conversational error analysis and reducing the delay in the speech as you would have noticed in the video. Uh, just highlighting some of the applications that uh, we are working on and excited about, um, and our result can improve, uh, you know, visual storytelling, including animated films, gaming, and online marketing, VR, AR experiences, and robotics. Another application uh, that we, for performance-based animation, could be for real-time live animation settings, where facial performance is a convenient input modality, and it provides novices a way to tell stories with animation via performance. On the same lines, auto lip sync makes it quicker and more immediate for live, live settings, and it has its own um, uh, challenges and different kind of uh, ways we want to solve this problem. And uh, yeah, I think uh, in the end, I would like to thank all my collaborators at Adobe Research, Microsoft Research, and at UW, uh, Paul G. Allen Center, uh, where I did my PhD. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Deepali, for the for this really, really great, really great talk. And we are lucky that we have some. We have a few minutes for. If we have a couple minutes for the questions for both of the speakers, so we will just proceed as usual. We'll ping pong questions back and forth between two speakers. And if you have additional questions, please feel free to leave in the YouTube live chat or in our Discord channel if we don't have time to to go through them. So first, let's give Deepali a, a short break, and we'll start with a question for Mark. So. Um, we're just curious, like your your algorithms work so great that we're just curious whether should people start using your algorithm right now and just ignore other techniques or there are some situations where you will recommend some previous method compared to your method. Yeah, thanks for the question. I mean, of course, I want everyone in the world to use my algorithm. <laughs> I think that would be awesome. Um, but I, I touched on the future work slide a little bit on this fact that the, the variable triangulation means that your output doesn't necessarily live on your original mesh. And I think for many use cases, this isn't necessarily a huge problem. Like if you got a mesh by just meshing some CAD model, maybe you don't care much about this geometry. But if you're working on a game and you've like finely tuned all of the individual polygons in your mesh, then this might be an issue that you care more about. And until this issue gets resolved in future work, then maybe you should use a a more classical algorithm for the moment. Well, okay, thank you. Uh, that that really makes sense. That about the triangulation. But other than that, I I really enjoy the robustness mm -hmm. of the method, like showing those like one hundred percent success rate, which is like really really jaw dropping. Okay, and next question is for Deepa Lee. Like, um, let me see. So most of the expression you you show in, in your your talk are more like large or exaggerated expressions. We wonder whether your method can also handle those subtle or minor facial expression, which are usually convey some kind of like, like I don't know, emotions or something like that. Yeah, so yeah, that's, that's a great question. And yes, we've been looking into uh, subtle expressions as well. Uh, for just this talk, I chose some of the exaggerated expression to show uh, the results, uh, but it can handle subtle variations as well. Uh, and especially in 3D, uh, where we go 
do variations and go from one expression to another, there is a range of expressions uh, that it can handle and show. Yes. That's that's great to know. I believe that this will be very important if you want to have like virtual reality, like face-to-face -face communication where you probably the subtle expression really makes a huge difference uh, yeah, in terms absolutely. of like the experience. Yeah. Okay. The next question is, is for Mark. So I believe this question comes from reading your paper. So they were, they're wondering, like, when you deal with a mesh with like multiple boundary boundary curves, and you 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 first insert a vertex in the middle and triangulate that, and then flatten it. And we're wondering whether this placement of this vertex influence uh, the flattening result. Um, so it, it definitely does influence the flattening. I guess the, the result that you get is uniquely defined depending on your mesh geometry. So if you move this initial vertex around, it, it'll change the end result a little bit. Um, but I guess I haven't explored this all that much, but we did a few experiments with just trying different ways of placing this vertex or setting the edge lengths incident on this inserted vertex. And it didn't seem to make a, a huge impact on the result. Like you could sort of change how, how round this hole winds up in your results, but all, all of the options basically look fine in the end. You always get this nice conformal map and whatnot. So we, we haven't tried too much uh, investigation into what, what the best way of doing this is because all of the options seem basically fine. Well, that's, that's great to know. And this actually inspired me to have a, a, a small follow-up question because you also show an example of flattening a polyhedral, like polygonal surfaces. Mm -hmm. And you basically take a, like for example, you have a quad mesh, you triangulate it and then flatten. But actually, if the, for example, if the quad is not planar and how you triangulate the mesh will result in different geometry. But I'm wondering like how the method, how the paper shows that they, you can get identical result no matter how you triangulate the shape. Mm, yeah, so... I guess in the paper, we really just mean polygon meshes with planar faces. Oh, if the faces okay. are planar, then it doesn't matter how you triangulate because it's always the same surface. If they're not planar, then it will have an effect. But I would imagine, again, that the effect is fairly small. Yeah. OK, understood. that makes total sense. So mm -hmm. the next question for Deepali is that for the lip syncing, uh, there are some other softwares, for example, like Jelly, like from our lab, which just works very well on other languages. So we we're curious how your method generalized to a uh, different language other than like, for example, English? Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. And yeah, Jolly is a great software and I've uh, read the paper and it's amazing work. Uh, I, I think uh, because Jolly also works in a 3D domain um, and it handles different languages. So we were not able to compare it uh, uh, exactly because we were working in 2D uh, lip sync. Uh, but our model uh, for 2D lip sync, it works, uh, uh, it works reasonably well because we are also relying on phonemes. So the languages that are uh, that have uh, phonetic representations and are able to handle you know, the standard phoneme uh, list then for those languages, it works uh, better uh, versus uh, we haven't done like an extensive evaluation on different languages, but just uh, the users have tried uh, Adobe products and, you know, just we've gotten feedback uh, for the model that's phoneme based, uh, it is able to handle for those languages. That, that's great to know. And actually, this also has a follow up question for that. So, um, so we're just wondering, like, probably we missed this detail in your talk. Like, do you need to first translate whatever audio from the user to like, to translate that into words and then do the lip syncing or actually can, or you don't need to this translation so that any arbitrary sound from a user, you will always have a correspondence. Yeah, so you, be trained an end-to-end -end network uh, for lip sync, so you don't have to translate anything. So you just uh, input the audio and then we handle uh, everything on our end. Uh, Oh, wow, that, that's very great. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, clarification. Uh, so next question is a very interesting question for Mark, is that there's actually some, someone in uh, the audience saw the interesting connection of this with the piecewise developable services that like you want to flatten things with preserve the angle and developable services, if I understand correctly, they flatten each part without any distortion. So wondering like whether your method or the ideas from your method could have some potential applications to make like developable surface algorithm. Hmm. That's a pretty interesting question that I haven't thought much about. Uh, and I think it's, it would be very exciting if people did this, but there's no obvious first step to me at the moment. I guess our method is built on this like mathematical tradition of studying conformal maps in particular. And I think trying to, to tweak it to, well, I mean, I guess, one, one nice thing is that a, a map is developable if it's conformal and also doesn't 
do any area distortion. So you could try to think about developable surfaces in, in this setting, um, but it's not obvious to me how you would then start changing your geometry in order to find these uh, developable flattenings. Although I don't know, may, maybe you could do something interesting. Our conformal flattening is the solution to a convex optimization problem. Maybe you can differentiate through the like optimality conditions to find some flow on your surface, but I, I've never thought about this. So I'm just throwing random ideas into the air right now. That's actually that's actually a very cool idea. I don't think like I don't think any I I, I think this could be an interesting interesting thing to talk mm -hmm. about to think about. And but I also see that a strong property of your methods that you can allow arbitrary scaling, but potentially develop surfaces you don't want scaling mm -hmm. so that you don't have area storage. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. Okay, thank you for for this answer. <laughs> and and the next uh, question for the police that let me see. Okay, so we so we usually. So also in your, your slides, we usually compare the result of those facial expression or lips animation by looking at the side-by-side -side comparison. Like, but I was just wondering where there are some good qualitative metric for us to, for example, measure the, the expression similarity between a stylized character or a human character or like the quality of the lips thinking, whether there are some qualitative metric for us to measure them. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. And we've uh, struggled with that metrics as well to find out if something like that exists. And, uh, and it's, it's a hard problem. Uh, uh, what we have done for our research so far is just doing a extensive A-B testing, uh, either if it's between stylized characters from one, you know, if we are comparing uh, different techniques of transfer, we would just transfer it on two different uh, you know, characters and then do extensive testing on mechanical Turk to get feedback. Um, and especially I think because it is, for example, in case of lip sync, uh, it is so perceptual that uh, there is one, you, you can come up with metrics where you know just consider the Zeem output as a sequence. And then you can just, if you have ground truth data, you can come up with some sort of uh, metrics there of how many transitions were missed and how accurate was this result. But um, we haven't seen, uh, as far as we know, we haven't seen anything in literature that's been published yet for these metrics. So that's one of the um, open-ended future work as well of if you can come up with a standardized metrics for uh, these results, which are more than just looking at them and getting lots and lots of votes and seeing if this is perceived better than the other, but yeah. Yeah, thank you for this. I believe, like again, this tied to how we human perceive the expression. So this really is a very tough, pro very difficult problem to come up with a metric for that. Thank you for the answer. And we also have one question for the mark. I believe that you already briefly touched about this for your talk about the surface parameterization. But we just wonder, like, how this method could be used to some general surface to surface mapping, not necessarily going through like a path of a sphere and then go to the other one, but just a surface to surface mapping, like like minimizing, for example, whatever uh, conformal distortion. Yeah, so the, there was a cool paper about this a few years ago, and I like two years ago, and I, I should know the reference off the top of my head, but I don't, it was either at SIGGRAPH or SGP, but I think it was called like intersurface mapping by a constant curvature surfaces, where they did exactly this, except I, I'm pretty sure that they just used CETM to do their mapping to a constant curvature surface rather than this extended version. Um, so yeah, I think you should just be able to take our algorithm and use it as a drop-in replacement for this mapping to a constant curvature domain. And then you get like all of the benefits that this paper observed with the intersurface mapping with some additional robustness to your input tri triangulation quality or just the, the geometric detail of the mesh. Oh, thank you for the sensor. It's, it's nice to know that yeah, there are some paper already method exists and we can just improve that method with your mm -hmm. method. That's great. Okay, we have our last question for Deepali is that uh, for your facial, we don't know whether you, we've probably missed this in the talk, but do you have talk about like, what are the deformation model you use to deform, for example, the lips or deform your face expression? Like what would be the good deformation model you to model these facial expression? Oh, so we, uh, for the lip sync work, we do not use any deformation because it's done uh, for the, the lip sync. We, the results are shown in 2D. So it's just a sequence um, of 2D images and we show the transition between, you just come up with the right 2D mouth shape sequence. So there's no deformation per se for, you know, the 2D sequence. We just, you just find the right 2D image sequence as a result. Uh, and uh, so there's no deformation model 
uh, there. But for the expressions, uh, instead of creating and using, a, you know, for example, blend shape deformation model, so we experimented with um, directly manipulating and controlling the facial parameters or the landmarks on the face. So we, we had in our training data, we had uh, annotations for um, just all the landmarks for 3D rigs. So we were controlling the rig parameters directly that we used as part of our training rather than using uh, a deformation model. So it's just the output, the input is the human face image and the output is, uh, you know, just the parameters uh, for parameter information of uh, the model, uh, the 3D rigs. Thank you for, for this answer. And that concludes our, our the session for this week. And now thank you everyone for joining this colloquium. And we also want to thank uh, our speakers again. And other than that, we also want to thank the artist, uh, Rachel Joanne Willis for making the poster for this week and see you all next week. <laughs>